The earliest cars were nothing more than motorized horse buggies. In fact, the first Oldsmobile was simply a horseless carriage with a one-cylinder, three-horsepower engine inside. But once mass production came about and sturdier cars were invented, they turned around and invented the 20th century as we recognize it. Automobile manufacturing was one of the first industries to use the assembly line. And these economies of scale, made vehicles like the Model T, cost less than an average worker's yearly salary. The automobile gave people freedom and access to jobs and services. New industries and services sprung up, including motels, amusement parks, and restaurants and fast food. Urban design was completely transformed. Compare an old European city, where everything in the core is within walking distance, to an American city, which is built around urban sprawl. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at cars that have shaped how we live. Some are iconic, like the Model T or the Jeep or even the Lunar Rover. Some are less iconic, like Chrysler's minivan, but they have a lot to say about the tension between excitement and safety in our technology. I'm joined by Eddie Alterman, host of the new podcast, Car Show, and he argues that all cars are great, even the awful ones. Even, he argues, the Pontiac Aztec, made famous by Walter White in Breaking Bad. He argues, and I largely agree, that cars are more than just a pile of metal, glass, and rubber. Some cars are rolling anthropology and say a lot about us and our society and culture. So in this episode, we're going to get into the history of one of the most important inventions of the 20th century and what they say about contemporary society, how we got here, and where we're going. Hope you enjoy this discussion with Eddie Alterman. The earliest automobiles were nothing more than motorized horse buggies. Ransom Olds, who invented the Oldsmobile, he sold a three-power contraption in the 19 aughts. But over the decades, cars evolved from being this soulless form of transportation that are as impersonal as an ox cart. And they become something that millions of people around the world, particularly Americans, use to express their identity. American cities are built around the automobile. By the 1960s, a teenage male, if you believe the Beach Boys, are only concerned with girls surfing and cars. So when do cars go from being a horse buggy with a motor strapped on the front to arguably the very soul of the United States? Well, that's a great question, Scott. And and it's one that I hadn't really thought about before. But if I have to point to a moment, I think it was probably the creation of art and color under Harley Earl at General Motors in the pre-war era. And I think what Earl did was fuse the two tracks of automobiles in America at the time. You had the Model T, you know, the affordable sort of everyman vehicle, which was kind of a proto SUV in a way, you know, it was built to to go over rough terrain and sort of replace the horse cart. It was sort of agrarian in nature. And then you have the glorious Duesenbergs and Packards of like the Gatsby era that were all sort of special bodied cars for rich people, really one-off cars that were not accessible by the common man. And and what Harley Earl did and what General Motors did was make design a real emotional driver for everyman vehicles. And with Alfred Sloan, who had that great hierarchy of General Motors, you know, a car for every person purpose from Chevrolet up to Cadillac, they created automotive desire and made it accessible. And they did that through design and through the, the smart application of constant updates I'm here in Detroit. and I grew up in Detroit. My parents grew up in Detroit. And my dad describes driving by or walking by car dealerships when he was young in the 40s. And they would soap up the windows so you couldn't see the cars inside. So there was this kind of like Apple iPad release moment, you know, where there was great anticipation about what was coming for the new year because they rebodied the cars every year. They look different every year. It's not like it is now where it takes seven to 10 years for a body refresh. And in the case of something like Tesla, even longer than that. So the democratization of style, I think by General Motors, by Harley Earl, who was one of those guys who built cars for celebrities out in in LA with his father, that democratization of style really led to cars being totems, cars being avatars for personalities, and cars embedding themselves in the popular culture. We'll get into particular vehicles, which form the topic of the episodes on your podcast. But one thing I would like to look at first is the early years of the automotive industry, because for you who've written about this professionally for a long time, I wonder if 
things could have turned out differently than the way that they did, or if the forces of evolution led us to this moment, there's really not much we could have done differently. And what I mean by that question is some have bemoaned the early death of the electric car, when in the 19 aughts, there were there was a robust electric car industry alongside uh, gasoline, and some thought that the forces of industry came together to smother that, and we were only coming around another century. I would say that the technological disadvantages of electric cars were simply too overwhelming, and it was ahead of its time. And you also mentioned Alfred P. Sloan, who came up with the planned obsolescence of a vehicle. So you have a new model every year, but you really don't have the sturdy workhorse of a Model T that could last as long as possible. Now, I don't know if I'm getting things wrong here, but do you think things could have turned out differently in the early years of the automotive industry the way that some think? Or did the forces of engineering simply lead us here and there's really not much of a different way it could have gone? Well, I think you're right. You know, it's a confluence of factors that led to internal combustion being the prime mover technology. But I think the big thing was the assembly line. Henry Ford chose to make internal combustion engines. He chose to pay a living wage for the production of those vehicles. He chose to allow those who had who made the cars, allow them to buy them, and thus began the kind of proliferation of vehicles in households. And I think it was the technological limitations of the EV or steam power, which was also um, a kind of front runner technology. You know, you had cars like the Stanley Steamer, but it was the confluence of factors. I think one of the biggest factors was the, the creation of, of the assembly line process and mass manufacturing by Henry Ford. Very true. And I think what people miss out too is uh, with EVs in the early 1900s, much of the United States wasn't electrified. My family from Iowa didn't have electricity on their farm, some of them until the 1930s or 1940s. So how are you going to charge the thing? Whereas petroleum is completely portable. So you can have gas-powered tractors and gas-powered farms all over the rural landscape by the 19 aughts and 1910. And people were afraid of electricity. There was a high fear factor. And, and the idea of electricity in homes needed to be sold to the American frontier. Right, which Edison took care of by electrocuting elephants in front of stages. So <laughs> really <laughs> solve that one. Um, that's a whole other story in itself. Well, I'd like to come to some of the particular vehicles that you focus on. There's one that you mentioned in your show that I think is definitely worthy of consideration for the impact that had on history. And it has a loyal following to this day, and it hasn't changed much over the decades. But on military history, this is a vehicle that I think is paradigm shifting. So can you tell me about the inception and influence of the Jeep? Yeah, the um, the Jeep or the quarter ton or, or vehicle that the Army set out to bid in the late 30s in preparation for World War II or entry into the war was really a recognition that this would be a war of mechanized combat, that the ranges would be far wider and longer and bigger than any man could walk or mules and draft horses could walk. And there would be muddy fields in the European theater. So they really needed to replace the army mule. And this was sort of an infantry request for something that could get on and off the battlefield with men and materiel very quickly and move across a vast range of the war theater. So the American army sent out requests for a proposal I think to 135 manufacturers, which speaks to your point of how many people were making cars <laughs> in those days. And only two responded, Bantam and Willis out of Toledo, Ohio, which is where Jeeps are made now. And, you know, the design was, there's a lot of controversy or alternate thinking about how the design came to be. It was a truly collaborative effort. Bantam sort of came up with the first prototype, but couldn't make them at scale. So the Willis design with that flat hood, that really prevailed. And it allowed us to do things in World War II that a draft horse or an army mule could not do. And it slogged through the bulge. It was pivotal, pivotal to our success in the European theater, particularly. Just a, a absolutely transformative completely consequential vehicle 
the quarter ton. It was the smallest, lightest vehicle that the Army had in their disposal and the most useful. I mean, it really is amazing that these prototypes actually worked and the manufacturing happened as quickly as it did because the time from Congress opening up the money spigot till something hits the field is at the absolute best a couple of years. And World War II is full of bleeding edge technology that in its early stages were incredibly dangerous. I would not want to be a crew member of a B-29, the first few, but the Jeep seemed to work pretty well at the beginning. It's surprising. Yeah, it did. And you're right. The, the timeline was incredibly compressed. They had pretty ridiculous specs. Like it had to weigh, you know, like that quarter ton that we talked about. I mean, it was, it, I'm sorry, not weigh a quarter ton. It was, um, I think that was the payload, a quarter ton. So I think the, the spec was no more than 1,300 pounds, but capable of hauling 600 pounds. So that's where the quarter ton comes in. Yeah. And I think the timeline to get a, a selection of working models was just about three months. And so, so Bantam produced that initial model. But as ever, the hard part about building cars is actually building the cars and do, doing it at scale. And that's where Willis and Ford came in. We see that with EVs today. You hear stories about I don't want to get too far far afield, but you hear stories about Elon Musk sleeping in the factory to make sure that they could launch the Model 3 and and build them at scale. And it's just very, very hard to do. And um, the people with the production expertise were the ones who were able to to get the contracts. That's what Elon Musk always says, that it's not hard to build the machine, but the machine that builds the machine. And, right. and he's not the first to come up with that. I mean, these pioneers of mass manufacturing, uh, blaze the trail, which is interesting about the Jeep as it evolves from the World War II era war chariot to the Jersey Shore beach cruiser. Why does the Jeep have such staying power? Is it because it's sort of, it doesn't evolve much and it kind of exists in its, in a somewhat stable form for a much longer period of time than a, I don't know, a Mustang, which was a muscle car in the seventies. And now it's some sort of electric hatchback. Yeah, that's a great question. And that very slow evolution is sort of unique to the Jeep. You know, there are many cars that have evolved over a long period of time, you know, Mustang, Honda Accord, Ford F-150, but they've really been modernized. To drive a 65 Mustang versus a new one, you wouldn't recognize the cars. But to drive one of the first Willis MAs and a new Jeep, you would feel that lineage, you know, very, very strongly. And I think it's something peculiar to the Jeep and what it means and the heroics of it. Um, you know, we don't want it to change. We want it to be that connection back to that heroic moment in American history. And other vehicles don't have that same association. I mean, you know, the Corvette's great, but look at what it is now versus when it started. You know, when it started, it was this sort of boulevardier, you know, like not really a sports car. American didn't have sports car expertise. When they wanted to go big with Corvette, they actually used the chassis of a Mercedes Gullwing for that, you know, a Stingray race car. And now the current Corvette, the eighth generation Corvette, is a mid-engine supercar. So that has evolved steadily through time, but it hasn't been as stable of an evolution as the Jeep. And I think it's important that the Jeep stays what it's always been, which is sort of military feeling, agricultural feeling. That's an important connection. It has perhaps one of the most passionate subcultures. I live in Missouri now, and there's plenty of people who love to go mud, and, and they almost always have a Jeep. So I suppose, why does it have such a passionate subculture? And then to tack onto that question, you've been in automotive journalism for a long time, so you are probably aware which vehicles have attracted a passionate following. What creates that? There's not that many people who are passionate about Pontiac Aztecs today, or at least I hope not. There, there are some, right? Really? Oh, that's... <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is ugh. a subculture. I mean, that's the funny thing. Car culture is a patchwork quilt of subcultures. But some of the biggest patches are things like Jeep, things like Tesla. Part of it is, you know, just the core functionality of the thing. You can have more fun in a Jeep than you can have in almost anything else. You can take the doors off. You can put the windshield down and go off-roading. And there are very few vehicles that have such a strong personality and that are sort of unlike nothing else on the road and are sort of uncopyable. I mean, the Ford Bronco is as close as you can get to a Jeep, 
but it's not a Jeep. Doesn't feel exactly like a Jeep. It's better. It's way better on road than a Jeep. <laughs> uh, but it is, you know, the the sort of what's the word? The the staticness of the Jeep is what keeps the fire burning in a way. And I think people love it because it can go anywhere and do anything, and just enables all kinds of adventure. Now, uh, not to belabor this point, but does a Pontiac Aztec subculture actually exist? Are there meetups or forums or is... Uh... <laughs> there, are. there are. I mean, you know, that was a vehicle that was uh, ahead of its time <laughs> because now everything's sort of a, a, a crossover utility. But it was just so awfully executed <laughs> design. I mean, I mean, look, <laughs> the proportions of it were weird, but it actually functioned well. The concept version of it was much cooler than what actually came to be. But there is a, I think Breaking Bad was one of the, <laughs> the elements in its redemption, right? But the, the Aztec's not all bad, you know? <laughs> I actually have a begrudging respect for it. I went on camping with it. They had a little add-on tent thing for the, um, for the Aztec. And I went camping at once. It was kind of fun. I was thinking exactly of Breaking Bad because it's an analogy of Walter White's early life where he has to choose something that's functional, but it's also ugly. And when you feel <laughs> beaten down by life, um, a Pontiac Aztec is the symbol of that. So it fit perfectly. Yeah, perfect avatar for Walter White, you know. And uh, But it also has a tremendous amount of traction in the LGBTQ plus community. That community embraced it without any kind of direct marketing toward the that cohort like Subaru has done. So, you know, it's like for for people who embrace their otherness. That's what the the uh, Aztec is about. This is very surprising. I mean, I um I don't know what this says about sociology that you can find a cohort rallied around any type of mass produced item, but there's quite a bit to unpack here. It's interesting. That's what our show's about, really, you know, how the sociology of vehicles and why we drive what we drive. I mean, if cars weren't emotional items, emotional purchases that said something about you, we'd all drive beige minivans. You know, it's really it's it is one of the things that is portable and tells the world this is who I am. This is what I I believe in. And um, Aztec is such a great statement to make. <laughs> it's such a <laughs> FU. It's great. Well, uh, there's an episode that you focus on one of the questions in the history of the automobile, and that's the pendulum between sleek minimalism and feature creep and stuffing with every possible final feature you could think of. And <laughs> with the BMW M5, which does, it, it's an analog sports sedan. It's a little bit sleeker and minimalism. But I suppose, what would you say about feature creep over the decades when you just get more and more things stuffed in and stuffed in and stuffed in and, and that? back and forth tension over the years it's an arms race you know bmw can't have a feature that mercedes offers i mean they're super paranoid about that they need to one up the guys in stuttgart and the guys in ingolstadt at audi they have to there's a saying that bmw or mercedes planning product planning happens in munich at bmw <laughs> and <laughs> audi product planning happens at Stuttgart <laughs> at Mercedes. And it's because they are all looking over their shoulders at who has more stuff. But we've reached a point of absolute ridiculousness. <laughs> I mean, the BMW M5, I drove two BMW M5s for our episode on the M5. One was uh, Malcolm Gladwell's 2003 E39 series M5. And that's the one with the sort of curved sloping hood, really beautiful. And that car is just analog. It's mechanical. There's no software, real software intervention in any of the major controls, like the suspension is mechanical, the steering is mechanical, the shifter is mechanical. There's a throttle bywire system, but that was, uh, that was like kind of the first faint toward that direction. But now vehicles are so software intensive that there's a feature on the new BMW M5 where you can control the radio just by moving your finger in the air. You can you can make a circle and the volume goes up. And there is this weird abstraction layer to these new digital cars that is sort of unsettling. You know, you're like in the uncanny valley. It's infinitesimal. You can't really feel it, but it's it's as 
infinitesimal as it is unsettling. There's something that we don't love about not having full mechanical feedback, full mechanical control. And, you know, electric power steering is kind of weird. It doesn't, you don't get much road feel. And all these things are, are sort of conspire to make the car less fun to drive. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. But first, I want to give a shout out to all the other great shows on the Parthenon Podcast Network, including Beyond the Big Screen. And you can find this and many other great shows at ParthenonPodcast.com. I am interested in features that died off as sort of evolutionary dead ends, because I think it speaks to the theme of history of people imagining possibilities that or perhaps good ideas, but didn't work for one reason or another. And I mean, there are so many of these you could think of with cars like swivel seats that, I don't know, try to have the idea of a boardroom or a limo for a car. Or I think a 1950s El Dorado had a glove box mini bar, which I think is pretty cool. You feel like you're in the Rat Pack. But are there any of your favorite of these defunct features for cars that you've come across over the years? Well, what happened to ashtrays? (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know, know, in-car GPS. That's really been sort of subsumed by Apple CarPlay and our smartphones. But it's funny you talk about swivel seats. If there is a future with widespread autonomous cars, we're going to see swivel seats come back. We're going to see lounge type seating in uh, in vehicles, almost like remember the first interior concepts for the Boeing 747, where you would have like sort of conversation pits on the upper deck. (laughs) Uh, You know, I, I think you take away the steering wheel and the pedals, if this is going to happen, and I have some doubts that it will, then the interior becomes a completely different place with a different purpose and a different design. Right. I've heard one argument that the reason cars seem to all look alike and a complaint of modern cars versus classic cars is that classic cars had a distinct style, but modern cars are all sort of boxy crossovers, is that when you're constrained by different safety standards and making a vehicle that is safe, but also roomy and also somewhat inexpensive, you're very constrained to what kind of form you can take. And it all leads to a convergent evolution where cars are similar. Whereas in the past, if there weren't the same type of safety standards, you could have, say, my beloved 1966 Volkswagen bus, which I drove in high school, that was a blast to do, but it was shaped like a bread box, horribly unaerodynamic. And if I got into a head-on collision, I would have most certainly have died because there's nothing between me and the Mack truck except the line of steel. So Is that the reason why cars are like that today or is it something else? Well, I think there's a kernel of truth in what you say. You know, there's the federal motor vehicle safety standard that determines a lot of placement of things like lights and, you know, things like roof pillars and and, uh, hood heights and things of that nature. Aerodynamics play a huge part in the overall design of a vehicle. But, you know, I think there are people doing some incredible work in automotive design that the designers at Genesis, the designers at Mercedes-Benz, and and they're making cars that are distinctive. A lot of it is also due to manufacturing technology and stamping technology. But I, I also sort of reject the idea that all cars before look different and all cars now look the same. I think there's nostalgia that plays into that. And I also think that General Motors was such a leader in design from kind of the post-war era or even the pre-war era to kind of the bad old 70s and 80s, that those cars really stand out as tremendously evocative, powerful designs like Camaros and GTOs and Bonnevilles and Impalas and and things like that. But, you know, I was on a a race in Italy about seven years ago, and it was called the Mille Miglia Storica, okay? And it's a thousand mile race through Italy, a little, a rally, more of like a, a Sunday drive, at high speed, but like high speed tourism of Italy. But it was confined to cars built during the original Mille Miglia era from 1927 to 1957 when the, when the original race stopped. And all those cars looked the same. <laughs> all of those Jags and Ferraris and Seattas and Oscars, they kind of all looked the same. You know, they kind of had that double bow side profile with the kind of vestigial fender over the front or kind of a, an integrated with a kind of echo of the cycle fender in front and then another fender in the rear 
And they all sort of look the same. The one that didn't look this look the same was the Mercedes Gullwing, but that was like, you know, for the time reverse engineered from alien craft. So I sort of reject the idea that, you know, everything was more distinctive then than it is now. There's a lot of commonality and a lot of style and a lot of, you know, conformism for kind of the same reasons we talked about before, which were everybody is trying to one up everybody else and people are stealing designs from other people. And there's just a lot of crossover and commonality, but it is true now that designers have far more restriction in terms of what they can do. And ironically, it leads to more creativity, not less. So I might be, a that might be a contrarian take and different point of view, but I think there are people doing great work now within even more rigid confines than existed, you know, in the immediate pre and post war era. One vehicle that you focus an episode on that is unquestionably unique is the lunar rover. And I love the symbolism of it because during the hottest points of the space race, when 4% of the US GDP is spent on NASA, the cost to get something into orbit is something like twenty to $50,000 per pound. So anything that we send to the moon that is not absolutely mission critical on life support is so important and so symbolic and laden with meaning like the American flag that it is as important as what you find in a burial tomb for an Egyptian pharaoh. What do we send to the moon? We send a big car. So... <laughs> It's one of the most incredible development stories for anybody who's interested in, ca in cars or the space program or, or just human achievement in general. Yeah, we got to get a car to the moon. How do we do it? It's such an American idea. And what's so funny about it is the idea wasn't, you know, it's such an American sort of manifest destiny idea, but it was dreamed up by Werner von Braun, who was sort of spirited out of, you know, like um, the guy wrote a great book about it called Across the Airless Wilds. A guy named Earl Swift wrote a great book about the development of the lunar rovers that went up on Apollo 15, 16, and 17. And he chronicles everything. And he talks to some of the people at Huntsville who were, you know, pivotal in its development. And at first, the plan was to send two lunar modules up there, one for the astronauts and one for the vehicle, the vehicle being so important to extend the range of exploration because astronauts could only get so far on foot. So to put them in a, in a car would allow them to really interrogate the surface of the moon, bring back samples from a wide range of areas and climb over stuff. And it was more important. I mean, Jerry Seinfeld has that great joke about, you know, like, isn't it enough to go to the moon? We have to drive around there. <laughs> but we kind of we did have to drive around there in order to find out what the moon was made of, find out, you know, to bring samples back and to see what we were dealing with. But, but the design evolution was incredible. It started as a, a six-wheel concept. And then with that budget cut that went from two lunar modules to one lunar module meant that the thing would have to fit inside the, the thing that carried the astronauts to the surface itself. So they had to find space in the belly. And they went down to four wheels. And I think part of what, and Swift makes this point, I think part of what led to GM getting that contract is that their vehicle looked most like the car, most reassuringly like a car of any of the other designs. You know, when you're dealing with those distances and all that untested technology, you want something that feels more familiar, you know? And I think that that was one of the psychological impetuses behind going with that GM design that, you know, might not look like a car to us, but the rival proposals were totally crazy. There was like one that looked like a space spider. It had these kind of floppy wheels that were like flower pots turned on their sides. But the genius of the, the GM design was not only that was car-like, but also those wheels that were able to cope with that terrain. They were like piano wire, piano wire mesh with chevrons like composite chevrons sort of sewn into them for traction really really cool cool design well another theme that you touch on and this has been a large part of the argument of automobile design over the last century is performance versus safety and you mentioned this in episodes on the chevy corvair and the minivan and i'm a proud minivan driver 
Oh, excellent. <laughs> it's very functional with children. I thought, you know, I'm going to get over myself. I'm not going to, you know, pretend I'm too cool for school. A while ago, I had a guest who compared the age of discovery to NASA's missions. And interestingly, he argued that NASA was too safety conscious that we're missing out on discoveries because frontier discovery is inherently dangerous. And that was understood in the age of discovery. And we sort of lost that human spirit of doing so. And now that same argument doesn't apply to mass transportation, because if I'm driving my kids to Chick-fil-A, I'm not really thinking about being like Vasco da Gama or Ferdinand Magellan. I just want <laughs> no one to die. But, so the considerations are different. But if I'm a playboy on the Italian Riviera with you know my ascot or scarf with my supermodel girlfriend, whatever, then the considerations are different. So how have you seen that tension played out in different vehicles? Hey, everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. Well, I think, yeah, we vehicles used to be certainly in terms of the minivan. And, you know, we talk about this in the Corvair episode. They used to be, you know, agents of freedom, you know, an adventure and risk. And that kind of that appetite for that really died off. And the, the symbolic meaning of cars changed from adventure vehicles to safety vehicles and things that that protected our families, particularly in the case of the minivan. You know, I think that point is true about NASA, but, you know, when Gus Grissom and, and those two other astronauts died in that test fire, I think that was a pivotal moment in NASA's sort of risk appetite. And the Gus Grissom was, you know, an American hero, and for him to die in a, a training exercise, I think was a lot for the American public to take. And I think some of that risk aversion is tied to the fact that we don't want to see our heroes die and we don't want to see anybody die. We want to protect our families. And that sort of trade off started to really move towards safety away from risk and, and adventure and freedom. And I think Corvair is a great exemplar of that. Corvair really has this reputation for kicking off a safety crisis in American automobile making. And beneath all that, beneath the Corvair, were, was two warring philosophies. One that was sort of initiated by Herbert Hoover was called the Triple E Safety Philosophy that said, we need to train people better in cars. We need to make them safer behind the wheel. And we need to create better roads. And we need to enforce that, all of that. So Triple E stood for Education, engineering, and enforcement. Education meant making people aware that cars were lethal. Engineering meant divided highways and better sight lines and gentler curves and better paving. Enforcement meant cops. <laughs> so that was one philosophy. The other philosophy was called second collision. And it put the, the second collision philosophy, put the responsibility for passenger and occupant and driver safety on the car itself and on the interior. So padded dashboards and collapsible steering columns and more, more seat belts. And, and the idea there, the, the larger idea that, that Ralph Nader embraced in his book, Unsafe at Any Speed, was, no, it's the corporation's responsibility to keep you safe. And, you know, what's funny about all this is think about Elon Musk and think about how he beta tests his technologies on his customers. And he doesn't really seem to care. I mean, how many autopilot deaths have there been? I think it's, you know, is it nine or 11 or something? I'm not exactly sure. He's made this calculation that like a, a real pioneer mentality that the technologies or advancement is inherently risky. And those bold souls who choose to embrace that risk are doing their part for the evolution of humanity. And that's sort of his philosophy. That was sort of a, an early space exploration philosophy, but, but that changed. And now it's sort of coming back in the person of Musk, who I think, you know, is, is taking a different tack on automotive safety. Well, we truly are entering a new era. And to tie these different themes together, I'd like to look at what you think cars are and what they will be. So the first part of that, something you mentioned in regards to your show is that 
all cars are great, even the awful ones. So how is that true? And uh, I'm also curious what you think some of the awful ones are. Well, there's nothing as satisfying, I think, to human beings as self-guided propulsion, (laughs) self-guided transportation. There's a sense of agency and control about whether it's riding a horse or riding a bike or being on a skateboard or driving a car that we just love. It's so empowering. And I think that that is such a powerful strain in sort of the set of human needs that I don't necessarily think it's going to go away. I think people talk about autonomous cars all the time, but I think the barriers to autonomy are not necessarily technical, although the, the technical piece is a big part of it. I think those barriers are largely psychological. One, we love to be in control. And going from a human-driven car to a computer-driven car, it involves a, a risk exchange. You're going from a voluntary risk where you say, I'm driving the car, I'm in, I'm in control, I know what, what I'm doing, to an involuntary risk where you say, okay, I'm going to let someone else be in charge. And it's akin to getting on an airplane. The threshold for things going wrong is much, much higher in that involuntary risk situation. It's like I ask people all the time, do you want to get on a 737 MAX right now? And nobody says, I mean, a few people, engineers will go, yeah, yeah, sure. But (laughs) most people go, hell no. And statistically, you know, it's infinitesimal, the, the risk associated with that plane. But it's real deaths, it's real people dying. And, you know, they were not in control of their destiny. And I think that is a huge psychological barrier. So it's, it's not just enough for autonomous cars to reduce highway fatalities or, or in-car fatalities from 40,000 a year to 20,000 a year. You have to reduce them to like nothing. And that's a huge, huge challenge because there's so many edge cases and the cars have to be so smart. You know, we take for granted how good we are. You look at most drivers on the road and you go, wow, those, there's a lot of terrible drivers out there. But in general, the human animal is excellent at self-preservation, excellent at vision, excellent at, you know, sort of sense of momentum. Our internal inertial gyroscope is very, very good. And that's a hard thing for a computer to replicate. And I think that until it gets as good as a human, I'm sorry, until it gets way better than a human, which is very, very hard, I don't think the adoption is going to be what everybody is predicting. We began this discussion asking when cars became the soul of America, from powered horse buggies to something iconic where you imagine gearheads and people fixing their own cars, tuning them up, creating hot rods, embracing adventure, going on Route 66. But as you mentioned, things are going to change, where with electric cars, they have a fractional amount of the parts that ICE cars have. They don't have transmissions. They don't have engines. All they really have as far as moving parts or cooling system pumps or HVAC systems. So on purely a technical level, they'll change. But we also talked about full self-driving. Whenever that's solved from a technological standpoint, what it means to have a car and control where you're going is also changed. So the way that cars really shaped the identity of the world, but particularly the United States in the 20th century, when many parts of what a car means changes, how do you think that will change us? Well, I think we don't change that readily. One of the big trends in automotive has been the changing nature of ownership, right? We used to buy our cars. Now we lease them. And now we use transportation apps like Uber and Lyft to get around. But for many people, the appeal of leasing and for going that ownership stake is that they get to keep up with the technology and they get to change sort of what they say to the world every two to three years. So it's only sort of deepened that kind of impulse for humans to show who they are and to that sort of mating display <laughs> that, <laughs> that cars enable, you know? So I think cars change and the economic circumstances around them change, but I don't think we do that readily, to be honest. I think we still have kind of deep-seated needs in what we want and It all goes back to, you know, girls and boys. (laughs) Well, as we touched on here, cars aren't just technology, but they say a lot about us as well. And 
for listeners who want to hear more, um, Eddie has a show called Car Show, which is a deep dive documentary style podcast on cars that shape the world with episodes that focus on particular vehicles and is available wherever podcasts can be listened to. Eddie, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Scott. It was a real pleasure to be here with you. All right. That is all for today. If you'd like to see show notes for this episode and all my other episodes, go to parthenonpodcast.com. That's the name of the podcast network that this show is a part of, along with other great history shows like Steve Guerra's Beyond the Big Screen and History of the Papacy, James Early's Key Battles of American History, and other shows as well. If you'd like to support this show, there are two easy ways to do so. The first is to subscribe to History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice and leave a review. The second thing is to join the show's membership program. It's on Patreon, and if you go to patreon.com slash unplugged and join it, as a member, you'll get completely ad-free episodes of the show's entire back catalog, which is 600 episodes and growing. Just go to patreon.com slash unplugged.